up next, we have Aaron Fitzgerald and Jay Hill. Aaron serves as the CEO of the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers in Action, an organization that represents farmers, ranchers, as well as food and agricultural partners who share a common vision to further our global, sustainable food systems. Joining her on stage from the wilds of West Texas will be Jay Hill. Jay's farming operation has grown from 10 acres and a John Deere 4020 into a commercial operation of 18,000 acres of highly diversified crops in West Texas and Southern New Mexico. Jay strives to continually implement new practices and the latest technology to best utilize his resources and farm as sustainably as possible. Welcome to the stage, Aaron Fitzgerald. Well, hi everyone. I'm Erin Fitzgerald, and I am excited to be here today, Jay and I, to talk about honoring the harvest, your dinner plates. And we only have 30 harvests. It's the challenge of a generation, and we need leaders in action now for a decade of ag. So I keep this on my desk. Look around your table. Eating is an agriculture act. It is really at our dinner tables well, where we witness culture, communities, and our very eco economics at work. And we are a unique culture here in the United States. Throughout our history in the country, when we have been faced with big challenges, we have always invested in agriculture. And agriculture has always stepped up to provide for our nation's dinner tables, rural economies, and the planet. After the Civil War, after the Dust Bowl, after the Great Depression, and after World War II. So it is no surprise to me at all when 87% of the consuming public wants solutions for their community and the planet that they turn to the agriculture sector for solutions. And in agriculture, we have an incredible legacy around food and agriculture. It has been ingrained in our roots and culture. We refer to our land as the land of milk and honey, a breadbasket, amber waves of grain. As a culture of a people, we even have a whole holiday dedicated to honoring the harvest, Thanksgiving. But maybe we have forgotten what it means to honor the harvest in the 21st century. Increasingly, our harvests are at risk. And there is no doubt that our farmer generations before us and now have always felt that the primary principle of agriculture is to provide for that dinner plate but we have, are being faced with one of the greatest challenge. And we're also on the precipice of having to serve our nation towards a greater purpose. And agriculture, agriculture, a culture of people, I believe is the one sector of people who can be called as leaders in action into the battle of climate change. So I'm gonna talk about sustainability 101. It's basically this, population times consumption does not equate to a healthy planet. We are currently consuming 1.4 planet Earth. We only have so much land, right? On August 8th was the Earth Overshoot Day. That was the day, you're all financial leaders, that was the day we started borrowing natural resources from our children and grandchildren. So that also means that by 2050, we're gonna have about, you've always heard this in ag, about 9 billion to 10 billion people coming to dinner, right? 30 years. Now, in, by 2050, I can imagine the healthcare sector, or I can imagine the energy sector, a level of innovation. But for agriculture, that means that we're gonna to have to produce as much food and fiber, energy, as we have produced in all of mankind, in the last 8,000 years. That also means for our farmers and ranchers, each growing season, when they go out into the field, they have to get that much incrementally better. 
it is a challenge of innovation and technology at scale that's unprecedented. And it is literally every growing season, those 30 years, it is a chance to get it right. And this is no longer business as usual, folks. We have seen extreme and episodic events. We're in Iowa. Last year, we had the COVID crisis that disrupted supply chains. And then we saw a derecho. At the same time in California, we were seeing fires, all sorts of stuff. I don't care what you don't want to call it climate change, call it climate weirding, but something is going on. It's no longer business as usual. I know American Farmland Trust is here. We are losing 87 acres of farmland an hour to pavement. Those are our flyways, those are our green spaces, those are the beautiful imagery that we saw in the land report. Those are the ability to sequester carbon. And this is not an easy business model. If you're a farmer and rancher in this, you're getting 14 cents a, do a dollar. And you're now getting more risk, more saturation, not an easy business model. And then there's this biological complexity of just growing food. We have over 20,000 different soil types, 21 different water zones, 28 different biological zones that are on the back of growing zones, that are on the back of those burpee seeds. And guess what? Those growing zones are changing. The weather's changing, the heat's changing. When you get in and when you plant, it's different. And we have how many different genetic types, Kevin, that you mentioned? Growing and stewarding all of this through that Mother Nature challenge is super complex. It's a biological complexity that the world has never even known. But I get really excited about a couple things. When I talk about sustainability, I do mean it is the green thing. Sustainability is about putting the economics in the business model. There are people, and many of you are in this room, I've talked to some of you over the last couple of days, that are looking to grow sustainably, to make investments that do good for the community and the planet. Environmental social governance funds are now at 12 trillion, growing at 34% per annum, and they are looking for a sector to invest in. And I would argue it is not Elon Musk. It is two million farmers and a bunch of people that steward the best natural resources. They care about land, air, and water. From a perspective of another asset that agriculture has, we are the sector where green happens. Do you know that we are currently sequestering 100 times more carbon than is currently emitted in the air right under our feet? Yes, the only living machine that can take carbon out of the air is some green things and some brown things, and I would argue some cows too. Suck it right out of the air. Go back to your sixth grade biology. And agriculture has already been reducing their carbon footprint. We are the most productive and we're reducing our carbon footprint and with innovation and technology and all the good work that our farmers are, and ranchers are already doing, we're projected to have our carbon footprint by 2035. And with innovation and ingenuity and new technology, we could be minus 4% carbon making us the one sector that not only reduces its footprint, but has a handprint in our communities. Or for the financial folks in the room, the one sector that can tr transition the United States to a net zero economy. And we are also a people that can go get the job done. We generate rural vibrancy. Food and agriculture is 15% of the American workforce. And guess what? These people, we, we care about leaving this land better for the next generation. And sustainability is about putting our values to work day in and day out, lining up the tough business model for that next decade. And I'm gonna bet on these people. If I care about land, air, and water like you, there's two million farmers that are stewarding 48% of the land mass in the United States. This is where 90% of all of our rain and snow falls. This is where 70% of all water is stewarded. This is our flyways. This is our carbon cycling potential. It is on these lands stewarded by these people who can go get the job done. But this challenge, the next 30 harvests, is the challenge of a generation. It is the scale of the technological complexity that Kevin mentioned. The ability to talk about this, the ability to have a clarion leadership-like voice. 
is not unlike going to the moon or traversing the ocean for the first time. We have 30 harvests, 30 chances to provide for our community and the planet. And it is going to take absolute every single leader in action to make this happen. Over the last two years, we have worked with CEOs to launch a decade of agriculture, creating a common vision, coming back to Kevin's why, a common vision, where does this sector want to be by 2030? We are the sector where green happens. We are the sector that can sequester carbon, and we are the sector that can transition the United States to a net zero economy. But it is going to take all of us as leaders in action, every farmer and every acre to develop those climate smart solutions. And we'll meet one now. To be honest, I don't know where to start. I was six when I knew what I wanted to be. You're only two now, but sometimes I swear I can already see it in your eyes. It was your granddad who got me into it. He put me in charge of my own acreage at 16. Boy, I had so many ideas. Heck, I was pretty confident about what I was doing, the innovations truly becoming more and more sustainable. I felt like I was on a mission. And if I'm really honest, I still can't fully wrap my head around how it didn't work. But now we're here at a point where continuing just doesn't make sense anymore. Your mother and I are selling the farm, every single acre. We talked to the bank and the realtor, it's going up tomorrow morning. And we, well, we're just gonna move to the city because it'll be a brighter future. And I want you to understand why. It's not just the drought getting worse every year. We were working to stay ahead of that, but costs keep running up and prices keep going down. Then one day you wake up in a place where one bad season can knock you and everyone you care about right over. And that's not a good place. I worry about how much we've invested out here. And at the same time, I can't help but think about what that investment brought us. It used to be nothing but desert here, and now there's so much potential in the soil. But it seems like nobody cares. And that's why we're leaving. I don't want to plant a dream in you, only for you to find out later that it's not a living, and that people don't understand, or worse, they don't care. They just blame everything on you. And you, you start losing your pride. And that's no life. The farm is everything to me, and I want you to know that. But my family means even more. So everything that I do, in the end, it's gotta be for you. Something to debate over climate change. Does agriculture have a seat at the table, and are we a part of the problem or part of the solution? Oh, my gosh. I think that we are the solution to climate change. We have not had the conversation that we actually can offset carbon from the fossil fuel sector. And we are cycling carbon. We are biogenic carbon, very, very different from fossil fuel-based carbon. right beneath us in the soil. We've been farming for centuries, and we're just now really learning about the ability of the soil to not only hold water and nutrients, but also sequester carbon and improve our environment. I'm inspired every day by our peers. We monitor our soils with GPS, and we know to the point 
how to manage our soil. That's really something, isn't it? Holding capacity, increase crop productivity, and increase carbon <laughs> sequestration. The superheroes. Our time is now, but we only have about 30 harvest cycles left to get it right. That is more important now than ever. I see the future is bright. We focus every day. Let's go home. Yeah. It's a very exciting time to be in farming because we will be one of the first industries to have a negative carbon footprint. What an awesome time to be alive in agriculture. A spot where the world is continuing and living on everything that we say and do. The survival of what we do is the survival of what happens to all of mankind. I had that dream. I had that dream as a, as a 10 year old playing in a tractor tire sandbox out behind my parents' barn that I wanted to do something in agriculture. We had 10 acres, 40, 20 John Deere, a little bit of alfalfa, a couple cows. My dad was a traveling salesman, and, and, and he went around and recruited people to go to vocational school. He told me, Jay, you always need to go to college, but if you're going to ever get out of the tractor tire sandbox, we're going to have to get you into some kind of vocational learning or some kind of college. We're going to have to get something ahead of you. you you've got you've to get your mindset out of the sandbox. And, uh, and much to his dismay, it never did. I enjoyed the sand. I enjoyed the feeling of dirt underneath my fingernails. And... As time progressed on at the age of 15, I said, Dad, I, I think I want to be a farmer. And he said, son, trust me, you, you don't want to be a farmer. I mean, there's, there's so many things that you could go out there and do. Just let, let's kind of let's, let's put that to the side for a little while. I said, Dad, no, I, I really do. I said, I, I think I got an idea of what I want to do. And he said, well, if you're really going to be a farmer, then I want you to go to the bank. He said, I want you to come up with an idea of what you're going to do to be able to pay your first operating note. And if they say it looks like a good idea, I'll co-sign with you. How about that? So he's thinking, which I'm thinking too, there's no way in Hades that they're ever going to do anything to give me an operating note. So I sit there for two months and come up with what I'm going to do. Walk into the bank and say, this is what I'm going to grow. This is how I'm going to do it. And this is how much money I'm going to need. They call my dad. Hey, Jim, have you looked at Jay's plan here? Well, yeah, not really. But what, they said, well, it's a pretty good plan. We'll do it if you'll, if you'll sign for him. So dad comes down and signs, and he's like, what are, what are you getting yourself into? What are we even growing? I said, we're going to grow onions. He says, why are we going to grow onions? I said, because all vegetable farmers buy a new pickup every other year, so I figured that's a good spot to go ahead and invest my money into. I didn't put anything in there for labor, though. And to, and to summarize a long story really quick is I ended up spending my entire winter chopping mustard out of an onion field listening to an old uh, cassette that had Wayland stuck in it. And I remember thinking to myself, why in the world did I decide to go down this route? I could be playing football games. I could, I could be chasing gals or doing anything else. Why am I chopping onions? And it was part of the plan. It was a part of the master plan from the man upstairs to lead me into a spot that shows the importance of what agriculture truly means to everybody today. So many of you invest in agriculture. So many of you are invested in agriculture from a producer standpoint, from a financier standpoint. The fact that we all got to sit together, commune, and eat together brings us all together in agriculture. But the thing that we're missing is the perception of those that don't understand what happens on the day to day. They don't understand the investment side and why would you invest in farmland? Why would you try to keep that investment in agriculture? Why would you go down the road of becoming a farmer or a rancher? Why do you want to work 60, 80, 90, 110 hours a week to go ahead and put just a little bit of food on the table? The thing that people don't understand anymore is as the, as the discussion of climate change begins to evolve larger and brighter and the sounds of what's happening in Washington, D.C. and our state capitals starts to evolve and how come farmers are the ones that are to blame for climate change, it's times like this that we offer a solution. 
that your investment into farmland is not just an investment into your bank account, it's an investment into the future of mankind. That you hire men and women, that us men and women continue to work and to till our land, to take care of what is in front of us. And these kind of opportunities are starting to show their dividends. As we talk about carbon sequestration, as we talk about farming in the desert, when they came out to film that, they talk about awkward. I've never, I've never done anything like that before in my life. And they bring this crew out from the Netherlands and they're talking and I don't understand the accent and he's scared because there's a gun in my truck and we're having this huge conversation about what's going on and then the cameras come out and they're following us around and they said, well, Jay, we just want to hear your story in agriculture. And I said, well, my story's tough. I tried to file bankruptcy in 2011. The lettuce still didn't work out the way it was supposed to. And I had to figure out what I was going to do. Was I going to just give it up? Or was I going to put my head down? Was I going to stay in agriculture? Was I going to go back to college and finish? What was I going to do? And he said, that's what we want. He said, we need to wrap that up into five minutes. Can you do that? <laughs> I'll see you in the morning with a cup of coffee. So we spent a week filming that. And it's been shared all around the world. And I've, I've, I've had the blessings to, uh, to get on an airplane and go across the country and across the world and to share people with what's happening in American agriculture. We are very few in this world. But the job that we do day in and day out is very large. The innovation that we bring to the table is unbelievable. And as you sit here and wonder about what your next future step is gonna be, either owning farmland, investing in farmland, brokering farmland, or just hanging out and having a cocktail with a farmer, it's important that you understand that we have got to get in front of the discussion of agriculture. For too long, we have sat in the back and watched the headlines come across about somebody that's spreading false information because they're sponsored by Monsanto, or one of us is off putting manure in the water system, and then we're looking at nitrates floating down river, and all of these things continue to fester, but you never see in the front, you never see in the front headlines of the New York Times, farmer fights to save planet. Farmer has the answer. Investor teams with farmer to save the world. And we can do that day in and day out. But until we get to a spot where we will stand up in front of people, and that's gonna take people that are sitting in this room that oftentimes you don't wanna get on Twitter except you wanna watch the dumpster fires that happen every single day, because I love to do the same thing. But if you don't stand up and start to fight for an industry that you're a part of, I hate to tell you this, and many of you already know this, they can produce it elsewhere. It's not gonna be the same way we do it, but we're gonna do it cheaper. It's not gonna have the same trustworthiness that I've got coming off of my operation, but they're gonna still get it into our store. For 80% of my life, I live 17 miles off the Mexican border and I've watched those trucks come across day in and day out. And I've watched how that food has been produced. And there's a lot of good farmers south of the border, but at the same time, when you're trying to make a buck stretch into a couple hundred bucks, it's not very hard when you don't have any transparency to worry about. That's why we need you. That's why the family farm needs to be saved. That's why the family farm needs to have the idea, the investment, the motivation to say that we are part of the solution. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to come in. I've got to, to rub elbows and, and to talk to so many people over the last 24 hours, and the discussion is positive. As we look at uh, inflationary numbers, as we look at the way the economy is, is supposedly going to cool down, I don't know how you took Alan's news today, but I was so excited and at the same time scared, do I buy a bulletproof vest or do I go buy bonds? I don't know what's going on. But at the same time, we have an opportunity to take the initiative and to save agriculture. Not only can we do that, we can make money while we do it. It's about saving our planet, it's about saving our reputation. And if we link ourselves together, if we share the story of agriculture and what the true hardship of agriculture and how hard it is to actually do it, and this is not for an attaboy, this is not for, hey, good job, pat on the rear end, you're doing a good job, this is what we need. This is me saying to everybody that's here, it doesn't matter if you step on a farm day in and day out, but if you're a part of some of this, we need you to step in front of this. If we're going to get the carbon market together, if we're going to get public perception together, the American farmer can still grow the safest, most affordable and abundant food supply, which everybody says, don't ever say it like that because it's, it's true. I go to the grocery store and if it says USA on the backside of it, I guarantee you I have a lot more faith in that than I would 
if it said made somewhere else or grown somewhere else. And without you and without your involvement, then we're gonna be sitting here 30 years from now wondering why does our best natural investment, why does the Midwest, our land of milk and honey, as Aaron says, this is our petroleum reserve in Saudi Arabia. This is what we have as a national treasure, our soil, our ability to suppress carbon, to, to inject that as a fertilizer source to help all of humanity and at the same time help those that are on the farm. If we're not gonna fight for that, then y'all just might as well start buying uh, non-irrigated farmland in West Texas next to me, because it's gonna look like that. And this is a, a challenge that we all have to get a part of. Look into supporting people. Look into partnering with people. Look at trying to figure out a solution to get yourself, your company, those that you support or those that you buy and eventually trade with, to get them in front so that we can dictate the narrative of what's gonna happen to our future. Thank you guys so much for your time. Aaron, if you wanna come back up, if, if there's any questions. I think we have time for questions, and the whole point is we're talking about climate change, we're talking about the future of ag. It's after lunch, who's got questions? It's and and how something. scary is the talk of climate change? Maybe. Because it depends on what bar you go to that night. You walk in to have a cocktail and you can say climate change and everybody's like, yeah, man, like it's totally changing. Everything is going to get there. And then you walk into another one and you say climate change and you're like, get the hell out of this. You don't even say anything like that. But at the same time, we have this awesome solution in the middle. The hardest thing is being able to connect the right to the left. And I'm not just talking about politically. I'm just talking about in everything. And so being able to sit here and say, regardless of where you sit on the fence with climate change, we offer a solution. If you believe the good Lord is sending a rainstorm in every other week and gonna, gonna hail out your crop and that's just part of the plan, we can get behind it. But if you think our carbon offset is too much and you're looking for a way to get that back into the soil because urban areas are sprawling and taking away from our environment, we also offer that plan. Do we think questions? Anyone? Hey, do we have any questions, folks? Because I'd like to throw one at you. I mean, um, Jay and I grew up a couple hundred miles apart from each other, and uh, it takes a strong man to walk into the Crystal Bar and talk about <laughs> carbon sequestration <laughs> in far west Texas. Yeah. But when you talk the facts and you lay out you know, the basics, the building blocks, what kind of reception do you get when it comes to people who are tried and true agrarians? Well, we want to we wanna paint a picture that's beautiful. We want to we wanna paint a picture, it's, it's a lot like what was talked about with wine. You know, a large process of drinking wine is understanding the story, the terroir. Um, with climate change, it's the same way. We need to be able to, to paint the story of where we're at and where we're going. Um, it can be lucrative if, this, if it is painted in the right way, but at the same time, it's responsible. So being able to do that, you know, with somebody that would probably say, I'm gonna need to ask you to leave this bar yeah. right now. Yeah. Uh, when you look there and say, this is what the financial gain is for you. Yeah. The fact that you get to stay on your farm, you get to stay on your ranch, is, is a lot more enticing than saying, well, I can't stand these greenies. Yeah. So. And, uh, you know, taking that a, a, a step further, when you see some of the breakout sessions, we're about to go to uh, our next round of breakout sessions, and you see the, the deep dive that we're offering as far as different carbon opportunities, it's not something that's being done in a onesie or twosie. It is a major, and I guess, Aaron, maybe you might be better able to talk about how broad the interest and how broad the scale is as far as entities and organizations that are really developing those markets and those opportunities. And so we currently have about 150 CEOs who've committed and pledged to the decade of ag, which was basically to say that they're willing to work with farmers. But what's really exciting about is that we don't just have a vision. We have two major action tracks. One is called transformative investment. I encourage you to get on our website. Uh, for the first time, we actually calculated how much money is actually moving in agriculture. And we now know that the carbon offset market's about 15 billion. Government incentives, if you think that that's gonna go up in this space, could be, you know, we heard from Sarah a little bit, about 18. But there's 954 billion in private sector money that is going uh, into agriculture. And our question is, gosh, if you could only grow real dollars by 1%, you've already eclipsed carbon markets, you've already eclipsed 
federal spending. So how can we create stackable investments and make maybe an announcement that we could grow by a trillion? How do we get economic growth in agriculture as the number one green investment? We should look like the renewable energy sector back in 2007, mm -hmm. 10 years from now, we will be the destination, the sector that is providing carbon, ecosystem solutions, rural vibrancy. Gen Z does not want to go in the city, they want to go out and hang out with you. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's one of those things that it, it, when it ties itself back to real estate, yeah. small town America, and so many, talk, so many people talk about the, the great migration out of small town. Well, if it, it wasn't obvious when COVID came through, we're seeing everybody want to come home. Yeah, the tides, the tides turned. It, absolutely. You know, I, I live in a town of 250 people, and there's currently no homes for sale. But at the same time, I get, I get an Instagram message all the time saying, hey, is there any property for sale around Dell City? It seems like a really nice, quiet place to be. And as we're starting to see that come back, it offers the investment portfolios to come in too with the farmland, uh, and the future looks pretty bright. What's your next, uh, as far as you know, that trillion dollar goal, what's your next gathering, what's your next forum? So we convene uh, leaders every year at the Honor the Harvest Forum. We've been in a digital format, same as Steve and the team here. Um, but it's really about getting the ag leaders together and food CEOs together because quite often, believe it or not, um, there's been a food fight for a long time. Um, the decade of ag is really calling on every single leader to say, we're going to figure this out. The, the challenge and the risks are too big, and we're going to work together, and we're going to make certain that we address climate change. We develop new business models. So that's coming up in September, and that's right before Climate Week at the UN and then the climate change talks. And it's really our goal to say, we're the green sector. You know, you might have forgot about us, but look across these fields. You know, look at these pictures. I think that this is where green happens. Well, that you know, the facts that you threw out about the amount of water, the amount of rainwater, the amount of groundwater, the amount of arable land. You know, when you look at it from that standpoint, piecing it together and and binding it as a group and creating that single voice, which, as you accurately pointed out, has been very disparate, spread way too thin. But like and your, your point about renewable energies, you know, to be able to facilitate and do something along those lines is going to be a tremendous opportunity. I want you to know that the land report is behind you 110%. <laughs> Thank you so very Later much for action. joining all of us today, and we wish you well going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, really enjoyed it.